JFK Junior Forum Live and interact with our student-run Instagram account at JFK Junior Forum for behind-the-scenes highlights. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming our guest and IOP Director Mark Guerin. Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Blake, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum here. We warmly welcome you to this evening's forum. This is a place where ideas matter and conversation is important, and uh, I think we're in for a really relevant and timely conversation this evening. We also take the opportunity to welcome um, those newly elected mayors that have arrived today. The Institute of Politics for more than 40 years has held a seminar for newly elected mayors and more than 25 mayors from around the country are, have arrived here for two days. We're with our faculty here at the Kennedy School uh, and current mayors and those who've served in these seats will be working with them as they begin their transition uh, to City Hall. And we're grateful to the U.S. Conference of Mayors and its leadership for the collaboration that we have with the, with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. So we warmly welcome all of our mayors here and we uh, are excited to have this conversation uh, this evening. Um, tonight's event uh, certainly is, is cr critically um, happening because of one of our IOP resident fellows, Bob Cohn, who really is here. Let me thank Bob. Let me recognize him right here, right in front of me. Um, Bob was an outstanding resident fellow who really um, brought great energy to his study group. He was the former president of Atlantic. And with Jeff, really uh, thought through the opportunities to have this important conversation. So Bob, we thank you for all you did as a resident fellow, certainly, in your leadership at Atlantic. Um, I think for everyone here today, we've had the opportunity to see this really interesting addition, this theme of how to stop a civil war, when a dazzling array of writers unpacking various topics in this critical topic. And we're very fortunate to have the editor-in-chief of Atlantic here to, to engage in conversation about it. But Professor Danielle Allen, our colleague here at Harvard, who's the director of the Saffir Center, wrote a very interesting piece for the magazine, The Road from Serfdom, in which she asserts that the unity must be made a priority again and offered prescriptive steps on how it can be achieved. Adam Sura's piece, Against Reconciliation, in which he argues that the nation's pursuit of compromise has often left it to abandon uh, its promises for freedom and equality for all its citizens, that Americans have been content to sacrifice uh, civil rights uh, for civil discourse. And Adam, we thank you for joining us to here today. And as I said, Jeffrey Goldberg, as the editor-in-chief, uh, will join the conversation and moderate. moderate. So to, with our thanks to to Danielle and to Adam and Jeffrey, welcome all of you. Jeff, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mark, very much. Thank you for IO, the IOP. For, thank you, all of you, for um, coming out in weather that I ordinarily would not come out in. Um, <laughs> but this is. Me either. There we yeah, go. Yeah, there, there you are. So thank yeah, you, everybody. Yeah. She's been here all day waiting because <laughs> she didn't want to go out. Um, but uh, it's, it's a pleasure to see all of you here. Um, thank you in particular to Bob. Um, resident fellow Bob Cohn at the IOP, um, who was until recently the president of the Atlantic. Um, he loves Harvard so much, he, he just told me that he's actually applying for undergraduate admission. Um, <laughs> early decision, I guess, right? You're going, you're going right, yeah, yeah, just to start over again, start the whole process over again. Um, but uh, we're, we're, we're uh, on behalf of the Atlantic, we're very grateful for, for, for hosting us. And um, it's great to be with Danielle and, and Adam uh, again, uh, we did a podcast a couple of weeks ago on this general subject. Um, and uh, before I start and before I basically turn it over to them, I want to make a couple of points that probably ought to be made. Um, the, uh, the, the, the conceit of this issue is, is how to stop a civil war. We did not go into this assuming that we are actually facing a civil war. I'm always very careful to, to state that uh, uh, that the country is not in an 18, in my opinion, the country is not in an 1850s moment. It's not an 1860 moment, obviously. Um, 
and, and uh, so nobody writing in this issue, I think this is fair to say, uh, and we have 20 or 25 amazing writers in this, and I hope you uh, read it carefully, um, believes that we are, we are in some sort of uh, actual pre-Civil War state in the way that we were in the 1850s. But um, we were motivated to do this by a couple of, uh, a, a couple of things uh, that are directly related to the Atlantic's history. The Atlantic was founded um, not very far from here, um, at the old corner bookstore in Boston, which by the way today is at Chipotle, just noting that for the record, <laughs> hoping to buy it back from Chipotle eventually. Um, um, was founded in 1857 by Ralph Waldo Emerson and Longfellow, Harry Peter Stowe, and, and so on, um, to, to, to grapple with two issues. Uh, abolition, uh, the, the cause of justice, uh, and national unity. Uh, in the founding manifesto of the Atlantic, um, the, uh, the signers, who included Harry Beecher Stowe and Longfellow and Nathaniel Hawthorne and Herman Melville and so on, um, our uh, state of the Atlantic would be the explicator of the American idea. They did not define, however, what the American idea is. Um, and we always believed that that was sort of an embedded clue, that each generation of Atlantic journalists was supposed to go figure out what the American idea was and then go forth and explicate. Um, that's what we're trying to do in this. And obviously we're very mindful of uh, the Atlantic's predisposition toward national unity and the Atlantic's historic predisposition toward the idea that there is an American idea. And that's what sort of motivated this. The, the proximate cause, the immediate cause of, of this issue was a lunch that I had with Danielle, not a few steps from here, about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago with Colin Murphy, who's uh, out here tonight, um, our editor at large, um, where we, where we rounded on the, the, the observation sort of generally accepted observation that something's gone awry, that something's a little bit off the rails in this country, um, that democracy is not working as it should, um, that the results of the 2016 election um, signaled that uh, the usual processes and the usual safeguards and the usual guardrails um, were not operating necessarily as, as they should. Uh, and one thing led to another. Um, Danielle uh, wound up writing uh, a wonderful piece for us, The Road from Serfdom, which you mentioned, um, and I'll turn to her in a minute to, to sort of uh, outline what that is. Um, and, and, and so over the, the next year after that launch, we honed and honed and honed this idea. And, and again, um, I think what you will see in this issue uh, is, is a wide range of viewpoints, a wide range of, of, of writers, all circling the same subject, which is what exactly, uh, why does everything feel so dysfunctional right now? Um, we asked Adam in particular, because we're the Atlantic and because we sort of encourage dissent e even within our own framework, uh, we asked Adam, he's naturally obstreperous anyway, um, we asked sure. Adam to come out against the idea that reconciliation is um, a necessary goal um, in the national conversation right now. And after Danielle speaks, I'll ask Adam to, to talk about that a bit. But Danielle, why don't we just start with you and if you could, in 130 seconds, um, just give us your life's work. Um, uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a brief amount of time, um, describe the impetus for the piece, um, describe what worries you, and describe, uh, as you do in the piece, um, some of the solutions to the problems that might ail our democracy at the moment. All right, <coughs> 130 seconds. Yeah, Here we go. 125 now. <laughs> no, go there on. we go, exactly. <coughs> so I start from the premise that human flourishing depends on empowerment personal empowerment and the opportunity that each person will have to be empowered as a co-creator of our shared world through political participation. So for me, the sort of beginning and ending of everything is that human flourishing depends on empowerment, including through political participation, and that makes democracy the one and only way to achieve well-being for human beings. Okay, we'll leave China aside, we can talk about all that, etc. That's where I start. Then democracy puts a really hard idea on the table 
If you're actually committed to democracy as a thing that human beings need, at the end of the day, you have to accept that you'll lose in democratic contexts and that being a part of a democracy is as much about losing as winning and that you have to preserve the form of unity that makes it possible for a big group of people to make decisions together. What does that mean exactly? I'm trying to make that more concrete. Lincoln is the best expositor of the idea that you can't have democracy unless you're committed to union. The basic idea is that the people get so riled up at each other that they refuse to go along with the results of democratic contests, the thing will break up. And if you accept the principle of breakup, then your smaller groups will have the same problem, they'll break up again as well. And so in other words, the biggest danger to maintaining democracy over time is fragmentation and disunion and breakup. So if you actually want to preserve democracy for people to live through, and be empowered in and flourish with, you have to prioritize making democracy work and justifying people's commitment to being in a union together despite disagreements, despite losses, despite all kinds of absences of conciliation. So union has to rule. Okay, so then the worry is that if you have a space of great disagreement, strife, and so forth, you have a danger of disunion, and that's a moment when political op entrepreneurs, demagogues in particular, take advantage. They take advantage of what people like George Washington called factionalism, and that worry that somebody will come in and promote strife and disagreement and so forth was one of the things that motivated the founding generation to try to design institutional checks to keep that from happening. So if you see a kind of demagogue arise in context of factionalism, what you're watching is the operations of disunity and the way in which they can work to take away the chance for people to govern themselves through cooperative structures of decision making and union. All right, so then that's the kind of theoretical background. I know I'm way exceeding my 130 no, no, seconds. But so then the question is, why is it that in our current situation, we are in as much of a state of disunion and strife and factionalism as we are? And so I try to make a historical argument where I point to social and political and economic changes over the course of the late 20th century that have led us to a, a point where basically Congress doesn't work anymore. Congress is dysfunctional. And that's partly because of changes to sort of rules around transparency. Sort of everything has to be done in public, so you can't have deal making and you can't have the sort of moderating force that you get from deal making. Um, but also, really importantly, economic policy has been put in the hands of technocrats through the Federal Reserve, monetary policy, and so forth. You know, the government never makes a budget anymore. It doesn't drive or steer economic policy making through our budgets. And consequently, one of the most important things our national legislature should do, it doesn't do anymore. So what can it spend its time on? It can spend its time on cultural issues. And of course, we have lots of things to fight about in the cultural space because the country had an informal constitution that was patriarchal and hierarchical and race based all the way through the middle of the 20th century. And then lots of us rejected that and have been working on building a new kind of informal constitution based on egalitarian norms. And so we have this huge cultural fight between two different sides, one side that's more interested in preserving the patriarchal structure and the other side more interested in the egalitarian social structure. And our whole politics gets consumed by that, displacing in some sense the most important business of politics, which should be us as a collective people steering our economy in egalitarian directions that achieve prosperity for all and give us a better opportunity uh, generally across the board. So the point is that we have all these different dynamics that have reduced the value of Congress to us, reduced the functioning of our democracy, we detach from our democracy, we fight over cultural issues, and in that context of strife and division, a demagogue can arise, and a demagogue seeks his own power in particular in general, that's sort of the character of a demagogue, um, and is ultimately um, in seeking his own power has mainly the motivation of sort of stripping public liberty away, taking away the chance for ordinary people to rule themselves through collective decision making, which again, they can only do if they're committed to doing that together, committed to a principle of unity with one another. Oh, that was a lot of that stuff. That was good. That was a lot of stuff. That was very good. So. The, uh, uh, as a segue to Adam, I want to ask you a question about reconciliation, about the idea that... Um, that at a certain point, uh, restraint in the way we talk to each other is paramount. That, that, that a shared understanding that we're in the same boat is a prerequisite for actually getting any of this done. Talk about reconciliation, the limits of reconciliation. Because right now we do feel, quite obviously, that um, there, is a, there are two parts of America and uh, those different parts are living in different realities, not just different regions or different mindsets, but wholly different realities. Obviously, realities that are shaped by the current media environment, by social media and so on, but we, we're, 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 we're 
so divided that reconciliation feels almost impossible. So it's true. I mean, I think that we do just have that experience of living in different realities. And I want to say a couple of different things about the concept of reconciliation. So reconciliation doesn't mean, from my point of view, always doing things civilly. Okay, so reconciliation can mean protest. It can mean prophetic rhetoric, which can be fiery and doesn't have to be sort of deliberative and rational. It can mean a whole lot of different things. The question is whether or not the ways in which one chooses to engage have in them the seeds of a commitment to an ongoing relationship. So in other words, do you accept limits on protest? And for me, that limit would be violence, right? So nonviolent protest, it's sort of this, the king spirit of the kind of action that affirms your commitment to the society as a whole, even as you're pushing it and challenging it. So reconciliation, from my point of view, is about demonstrating consistently in whatever mode one has of interacting that one is committed to the whole of society. Um, you can think of it as a principle of charity as well. And you can also think of it as a principle of, I like to say, just like fake it till you make it, which is means act like people that you feel like they're your friends. Like you don't have to actually feel friendly to people. You just have to act as if you do. And if you can perform that commitment and connection over and over again, that starts to make space for people to actually do things together. So it's about performing a commitment. It's not about feeling. That's the important thing for me about the concept of reconciliation. Adam, uh, take it from there. Talk about your worry about reconciliation. And, and, and let me ask you this specific question, and, and it's going to sound a little bit like a joke, but it's not. Uh, what, are the, what are the limits of your ability to fake it with your fellow Americans? To the, to, and, 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 and I'll use a, an example, somebody who's consistently in the news. Do you think that you and Tucker Carlson share the same American reality? No. I said, we know the answer to that one already. No, we do, <laughs> we do not. But uh, I, I think, look, um, you know, my piece is essentially, I wanted to look at, uh, you know, obviously political discourse right now is characterized by a tremendous amount of vitriol and, and anger. Uh, and I wanted to look at the structural causes of that rather than simply, you know, saying, oh, well, it's social media. Oh, well, it's woke culture or something like that. I wanted to go into why we're having this extremely heated argument. And my argument, and, and what I, the conclusion that I come to is basically that our civility problem is actually a polarization problem, and our polarization problem is uh, born of our unresolved race question. Now, why do I think that? I think that because um, when you look at polarization, the parties are, pol are increasingly polarized along racial, religious, and cultural lines. Now, that, that's not happening equally. I mean, you have one party which is, um, heterodox in terms of its uh, in, in terms of its composition. There's you know the 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 uh, white hipsters in in New York City who are electing AOC are not the same as uh, the black church ladies in South Carolina who are getting on buses and going to the polls every election day. But they are stitched together in a multiracial, multicultural, multi-class coalition that breeds a certain kind of tolerance at least for each other, if not necessarily for the opposition. Whereas the Republican Party is increasingly a party of white Christians with few, with very little diversity, and with that comes a kind of general intolerance for people who are different. And you can, and 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 we can see an example of that occurring previously in history, and that was, you know, ironically enough, the old Democratic Party and the old Republican Party at the end of the Civil War and the beginning of Reconstruction, and the way that that era of heated racial polarization ended was with a bipartisan consensus on white supremacy that essentially excluded um, the uh, Republicans' black constituency from the polity. Those, uh, all of a sudden, rep white Republicans and white Democrats, white Southerners and white North Northerners agreed to get along and sort of uh, allow the South to do whatever it wanted. Um, and that was not simply a matter of, uh, it, although it had a lot to do with Democrats retaking and reconstruction governments by violence, it also had to do with the Republicans essentially saying, we're gonna wash our hands of this. The Supreme Court that basically ratified uh, the new system of, apar of racial apartheid in the South was largely made up of Grant, Lincoln, 
uh, Hayes appointees. These were not, you, you know, these were these guys were unionists. They were abolitionists. They were not what you would necessarily think of as, you know, they, they were not people like Nathan Bedford Forrest, for example. But they came to a uh, a kind of reconciliation um, that lowered the temperature that was essentially built on the exclusion of non-whites from the polity in defiance of the uh, Reconstruction Amendments in the country that the framers of those amendments were trying to build. Um, and so my argument is basically this question of reconciliation should not be prized over uh, the survival of liberal democracy itself the way it was uh, you know, more than 100 years ago. Uh, it, it, the, the question of how we end polarization, um, the, the terms on which it ends are far more important than the fact that it ends. Um, and if it does not end uh, in a way that um, recognizes the full citizenship of all Americans, regardless of background, then it, it, it's not going to be a, a real or a true reconciliation. Right. So, so our colleague, uh, Yoni Applebaum, in another of the anchor pieces uh, of this issue, um, argues that we are engaged in uh, a pretty novel experiment for, uh, for a democracy. We are trying to move from a majority white uh, democracy to a true multiracial democracy. He argues that really hasn't been done successfully uh, on the planet yet. Um, obviously, it's only one experiment we're uh, going through. Uh, we're going through experiments in communications and even cognition. Um, but he pinpoints this as, um, as the great challenge. What would it take to get through this phase? What would have to change, let's say, in... Um, a Republican Party that you think of as increasingly white nationalist in orientation um, to, to change. And how does that change? How do you possibly imagine that change happening? Well, I think that the, the I mean, typically the way that um, the way that parties depolarize is that they lose and then they sort of move in the direction that the winners are in. Um, but what we have is a sort of structural situation where the Republicans represent a, a minority of the electorate, but because of the um, structure of our political system are capable of holding power even if they do not win a majority of the votes. And that not only creates a tremendous amount of tension between the two factions, um, but it means that Republicans can sustain uh, a, a, a can sustain power even with a constituency that is far to the right of the rest of the country and they don't have to move left at all. I mean, if you look at, uh, if you look at the Democratic Party, um, you know, in the 80s and 90s, they moved right because they felt that that's what they had to do to win. And we, we basically have a weird destructive stalemate uh, in which uh, the Republican Party simply does not have to, as it considered doing in the aftermath of the 2012 election, where it does not feel like it has to reach out to elements of the other party's constituency, uh, multiracial constituency in order to So win. let's assume that the Senate doesn't abolish itself in the near future. What is there another pathway? And I'll come to you because you think a lot about legislative reform. Yeah. But what, Adam, what do you, if the Republicans can't structurally lose, how does this change? I don't know. Well. I just know that, I, I mean, I, I don't have any answers to that question. I, I, I just, all I know is that the, historically, it, 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 these conflicts in the United States have not had a happy ending. And so for me, less important than ending the conflict is making sure that the conflict ends in a way uh, in which liberal democracy is pre preserved for all of America's citizens. So I want to agree with some of Adam's core points, which is to say that reconciliation that does not include everybody isn't reconciliation. So from my point of view, when Adam says he's against reconciliation, the thing that he's against is not actually reconciliation, right? I mean, yes. it's domination. Mm -hmm. um, and so reconciliation is a higher standard, and we have you know, evolved our understanding of constitutional democracy to include a principle of inclusion or the entirety of the citizenry, the entirety of the population has to be included in the structures of reconciliation in the kind of concept of unity that I'm advocating at any rate. So then the question is, okay, how do we get from where we are to something that actually achieves that sort of the point of where the conversation was? And I do think that there really are meaningful reforms to our political institutions that we can undertake. Um, I think it's important 
to say that, so that, you know, the, the point of, of how you design democracy is to produce structures that make it worthwhile to people to keep investing in this process of doing work together. And the situation that you've just described, where a kind of minority for structural reasons um, has a sort of level of power that is undermining of the general functioning of the democracy um, is a problem. Like it will sort of force disintegration and that sort of structural feature is the kind of thing you have to kind of design away from, right? So how do you actually do that if there's kind of a, a sort of grasp on power through the electoral college through the structure of the Senate? Um, I do think that it's time to increase the size of the House of, the Rep of Representatives. It's not straightforwardly clear in the near term which party benefits the most from that kind of adjustment, and as a result, it's the kind of thing that might actually be doable, but would change the overall um, sort of overweighting of rural areas, reducing that overweighting into a place where sort of the majority power, minority power is a little bit better in balance. And that's not to say that's the whole of a solution, but. Relatedly, I do think that you can drive changes at the state level. So, you know, independent redistricting commissions are a really mm -hmm. important thing, which I think it's a realistic thing to imagine we could get up to about two thirds of states adopting these as a way of actually structuring uh, congressional districts and so forth. Um, and that, you know, if you especially if you could couple it with state level reforms around things like ranked choice voting, um, could drive moderating um, elements in our politics, which could change the electoral dynamics, even affecting that sort of uh, the federal sort of power structure situation. So the point is just that we're not trapped in the federal structure because we have this amazingly elastic state system. And so you can drive a lot of change and reform through that state system. And that, from my point of view, is really what we ought to be doing as we sort of work on trying to figure out the design for our contemporary circumstances, 21st century democracy, that makes good on the possibility of participation for the whole population and makes sort of a commitment to unity, a commitment to these institutions we share together, worth people's time. Because my biggest concern right now is like that kind of commitment is not worth people's time. And so I feel like that's really where the kind of force of reform efforts should be, is restoring functional institutions um, that have a kind of plastic and move mobility and the balance of power among the, you know, both sides and so forth, so that it's worth our time as ordinary citizens. Let me just press us. on that just for one minute. It's, it's, it's fine and, and logical to say that we need to restore the functioning of our institutions. How? What's the first step? You're elected president. What's the first thing you do? Well, so I, I mean, again, I don't think it comes actually at the level of the president. And so that's, okay, that's where it's hard. Okay, you're elected mayor of Cambridge. Okay, I'm elected, there we go, a, a mayor here. So, you know, I think mayors have a lot to contribute, in fact. So, for example, I invoked the concept of ranked choice voting, right? Which is where instead of just voting for one person, you vote for persons one, your first choice, second choice, and third choice. And if your first choice person doesn't get up to a certain degree, your vote rolls over to your second choice and that sort of thing. What's the result of that? A few things, sort of evidence suggests in ranked choice voting context, candidates have to campaign to be people's second choice and third choice, as well as their first choice. And so you take a sort of demonizing of the adversary element out of the campaign structure, um, and in various ways, because everybody's vote ends up mattering much more, you have a kind of moderating impact. People don't campaign to the extremes of sort of partisan opinion. You have a chance to bring moderation into politics. Mayors can help drive the use of ranked choice voting in cities, and in so doing, teach Americans what this institution is, what this mechanism is, um, drive it to the level of use at states. I mean, people, are, Manhattan, just, or New York, all boroughs just adopted ranked choice voting. So we're going to have millions of Americans using this in the next two years. Um, and so that'll be an example. And then can you move from that to states adopting it? So the, I really don't think that the changes we need are going to come from the president. Um, they, some of them might come from Congress, but I think the most important place where we need to work is at the municipal and state level. I think the big obstacle to this, honestly, is that you have, uh, I mean, you have a, 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 a faction of people in the United States who really feel like they are fighting an existential battle against annihilation. <laughs> and that is a sense of vulnerability that I think is inaccurate, but it is one that the president has cultivated to tremendous advantage. So they don't feel like they can lose because if they lose, then it's over for them. And that's why they're, it, they're perfectly fine with the president doing something like extorting a foreign country um, into uh, implicating his uh, political rival in a crime that simply did not occur. Um, it's, it's why they're okay with the president um, lying to the Supreme Court uh, in an effort to use the census to impose a nationwide racial gerrymander. It's 
it's why they're fine with delegitimizing uh, the majority of the country because it does not uh, it, because the rival coalition does not uh, resemble theirs in origin and therefore does not uh, have uh, the, it does not bear the true heritage of the nation uh, in, in its composition. I mean, the, 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 at some at some point, this question, this like existential insanity. Um, has to be dealt with. Um, and you see this, I mean, it, it, you, I mean, this is why, I mean, there's some things that seem extremely ridiculous that the president invokes, like when he says, you know, we can finally say Merry Christmas again, or liberals want to change the name of Thanksgiving. These are deliberate strategies to create the sense that conservatives are under siege and they will be wiped out if not for Donald Trump. So it doesn't matter what Donald Trump does. It doesn't matter whether he breaks the law. It doesn't matter whether he violates the Constitution. Um, he's the only one standing between you and total Armageddon. And, I, and to me, that's the, the, the real obstacle is this mentality. And, and I, I, I honestly don't know how you resolve that in a way uh, that makes people feel as though they are not, uh, you know, fighting for their lives. And I, it, it, because I, I think they're not. I think they simply just do not want to relinquish a power that they are used to holding for themselves and have for, you know, 200 years. Right. Uh, we're going to go to questions from the audience in a, in a minute, and there are mics here and there, and the lights are blinding us a little bit, but I think there's mics upstairs too. Um, but before we, we do that, and please line up if you have a question. Um, Adam, let me just follow on that uh, very quickly. Um, you are never, in my experience, Mr. Sunshine. Um, <laughs> But you're, you, you know, when I, when, I, when I said at the beginning that um, we're using Civil War as a metaphor, um, uh, we're, we're, we're using it as a, as, a, as a way of concentrating the mind on how split we seem to be. Um, you do seem to be suggesting that things are getting worse, that these attitudes uh, are solidifying, that a portion, not a geographic portion of the United States, but a portion of the United States, the population of the United States, feels as if their survival um, is in danger. Um, how, how bleak are you going into 2020? Um, I mean, is something something has shifted in the last time, since the last time we spoke? So last I week? think that, the, you know, it, I, I, I do not uh, think uh, that the Democrats' chances for winning the White House are tremendously good. Um, I... I I, I do. I, I will say though that one, the big difference between the United States at the end of Reconstruction and the United States today is that there is something um, resembling, or, 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 or uh, there is a majority of the electorate that is committed to, w w at least rhetorically, to what I would describe as anti-racist principles that simply did not exist in the late 1870s. A majority of white people in America were not racial egalitarians, north or south. Um, but a majority of the country today um, is at least nominally. And I think that is a, a very different situation to be in. And I think it's one that in general, uh, people should be optimistic about. Um, I, I don't know that it translates into uh, defeats at the ballot box for Donald Trump and the coalition that he's assembled. So um, I think Adam's point about existential threat um, as a feature of our contemporary politics is correct, but I would characterize it slightly differently in the sense that I think it is the case that when you watch, say, the Republicans in, in D.C., in the House and in the Senate, work in lockstep in, for example, the current conversation about impeachment, um, you are watching people who understand themselves to have an existential threat politically. That is, they know that if they don't support the president, then the, the slender reed that which they're clinging to maintain electoral power is broken for them, right? But I think in that very specific existential threat, which is kind of glomming up our politics, there is a real mixture of just like the most base political self-interest of a person who likes to have power and be in politics, as well as the other kinds of broader, more substantive existential threat that you're talking about. And I don't think we actually know the full kind of recipe and mix sort of working to glue those different kinds of interests together. And I think it's really important to remember that the same people who are, you know, in this kind of really sol solid way holding that power structure together 
Um, a whole heck of a lot of them voted for Obama not that long ago, which says something about the plasticity of people's hopes and aspirations. And so I think we have to recognize that there was some considerable disappointment in how the Obama presidency worked out that we haven't completely reckoned with, frankly. And so that trying to figure out how to reactivate mobility in those political spaces is about coming to grips with that. But is it, is it about Obama's performance or is it about um, a, a machinery, and I want to use my words with restraint, but a, a, a media machinery uh, a, a, and, and a, a faction of the Republican Party that demonized Obama at every turn, even in the last few days, Donald Trump spoke in public at a rally about defeating Barack Hussein Obama, as he said. I, I mean, how much of it is on Obama and how much of it is, um, is an implacable machine? I don't think it's mutually exclusive. Exactly, I mean, I think there's yeah. no question but that the Obama administration, um, it, it, the Obama administration prevented the collapse of the American economy, um, but the recovery was slow and brutal. And I think it, it's, it's, it's just a simple fact that a lot of people, um, you know, th their economy may have recovered in, in the sense that it is, you know, it, it is humming along now and it was humming along towards the end of his administration, but a, a lot of people suffered through that. And I do think that there is, I mean, I, I do not think that Donald Trump w would be president today without the kind of disappointment and frustration that is genuinely rooted in real things that she's talking about. Right. Uh, why don't we go to some questions over here first, thank you. Thank you so much, especially uh, you, Adam, for coming after having a, a being a, a new father. So congratulations. Thank on you. That. I mean, Evid, follow you on Twitter and your, ex, your adorable pictures. Thank you. Um, <laughs> well, here's cats Alan. are cute. But also his cats. What about his cats? Exactly. And, and the cats as well. Cats are cute yeah. too. A lot of yeah, cat okay. Twitter. Yeah. I was just checking. I probably won't get as many retweets as Steve Kerr got for retweeting. <laughs> but, um, Professor Allen, I was wondering, in terms of your conception of re reconciliation, one critique of the Obama administration was that after some of the actions that the Bush administration had done around torture, um, around warrantless surveillance, et cetera, that there wasn't this idea of holding people accountable after, that we, we, you win, you, you move on, and this idea of creating that democratic space where the losers still feel like they're not going to be persecuted despite some action. So I think that, that Adam's written so evocatively is about how cruelty is the point. There's been so many activities of the Trump administration that have been bitterly cruel. And so I wonder if you could discuss a little bit the tension between, if things change politically, um, between holding accountable activities from prior administration, especially this administration that has done things that we would argue are criminal, but also creating that space for reconciliation. Is it is there something like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission along the South African model, or there are there other ways that you maintain that balance where there's accountability, but also reconciliation? Well, I think, you know, it's interesting that you bring up the torture thing, because I think you can draw a pretty direct line between Obama's decision to uh, continue most of the Bush national security regime and to avoid accountability for anybody who is involved with the illegal aspects of it. And Donald Trump's um, pardons of uh, American service members convicted of war crimes. I mean, the, the, there, there is a, dis, you know, the Bush administration justified its, uh, its, its use of torture, um, not solely on a sort of a legal, uh, jargon that tried to say that torture wasn't actually torture, but also on the identity of the people who were being tortured, who had some sort of, uh, who, 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 who they argued had some sort of religious obligation to feel pain before they could actually talk to their interrogators. It was completely false. Um, and then the Obama administration came along and they blocked every avenue of both civil and criminal accountability for the people who, uh, who, who built that program. And so if you're creating a sense that what you do to these people, um, it, you know, because they are, des they are designated enemies of the state, uh, does not actually count as criminal or even wrong in any way, not even in, in a civil sense. Um, then, you know, it, it is not a great le leap of logic to say that the people who commit those crimes should be celebrated r and, and, and rather than criticized at all. Uh, and, and that's how you get to someone like Donald Trump. I mean, the, the fact is, and, and this is something that I've been writing about for the past three years, the fact is, is that there is nothing uh, that Donald Trump represents that was not already here, that was not already a part of us. Uh, and so when people look at it and they say, uh, you know, well, this isn't America. Well, that's not really true. 
he comes from somewhere. He comes from a, 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 a intellectual and historical lineage uh, that Americans do not like to acknowledge or that some Americans do not like to acknowledge. Uh, and, and I think you can, as I just said, you can really, I mean, in particular with the, with the post 9-11 uh, uh, Bush approach to national security, you can trace that approach directly uh, to what we're seeing today. Um, can we go up there real quick? Thank Hi, my name is Kiana. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, my question is surrounding education, which has long been and is to this day, um, a hu has played a huge role in shaping the character and values of American citizens. And as we know, the education system today, across the country, there are implicit and explicit explicit curriculums that perpetuate the kind of um, intolerant mindsets that can breed hate. So I'm wondering if, if you see any possibilities for um, how educational reform can actually help sort of create a spirit and energy for reconciliation um, in future generations. So um, I want to say a couple of things to link your question to the previous one as well, if you don't mind. Thank you for your important question. Um, and some of this will go slightly probably athwart um, where most people's spirits are these days. But frankly, I think this country is just too punitive, period, in all contexts. And so I actually am not super supportive of um, sort of being as punitive in all the areas that we haven't been punitive in before as we have been in the criminal justice system over time. I think in general, we have to take our penal orientation out and focus on restorative justice. And I mean that in the context of what we think of as criminal justice, but also actually in the world of economic policy. So rather than thinking that we should be throwing folks from Goldman Sachs in prison right now, I think what we need to be doing is fast changing our economic policy in the direction of restorative, what I think was restorative justice approaches to economic policy for the diversity of geographic regions of the country. And that's like a place-based economic policy and things like that. But this relates to your education question in the sense that I think actually um, achieving reconciliation requires starting from a principle of charity, which means actually starting from the presumption that there are more people working in good directions out there than those of us who sit in elite spaces sometimes acknowledge. And so I do think, for example, that we need to rebuild civic education, and I think that there are uh, lots, there's lots of work to do in that space, and we lost civic education because of polarized fights, right? So when the National Governors Association brought in the Common Core, they wanted to have standards in math and English language arts and social studies. They failed to achieve standards in social studies because they could not agree over how we narrate the history of this country, okay? Because we have a fight, and this is to your basic point about racial reconciliation, we have a fight over whether we tell the gory story or the glory story, right? The story about enslavement and genocide or the story about American triumphalism. And that fight is simply poisonous. And so the work that we collectively have to do, regardless of whether people are on the glory side or the gory side, is actually face the need to integrate those two stories. That we can be honest about the crimes of the founding at the same time that we can be appreciative of positive inventions. And so I think that one has to start, as one's thinking about the kind of education that we need to open up space for tolerance, by being tolerant, actually, um, by accepting that there are parts of the glory story that are okay, and we should be appreciative of that, and that we also absolutely need to be clear and honest about the gory story without letting that pull us into cynicism. And I do think that this work is actually the hardest work we have in front of us, getting ourselves to a space where we are collectively willing to tell ourselves a story about who we are as Americans that has both of those pieces in it. Um, I, don't, I don't know about structural reforms, but I think uh, if everybody making more than $100,000 a year in America sent their kids to public school, we would be way better off. Here, here. And, and that's because public school is maybe the only institution left in America where people of, of completely different class, social, ethnic backgrounds can actually meet each other and learn to be, and learn what it's like to be around people who are different. And uh, I, I think it is just a tremendously important institution and the people who are, you know, we have this sort of insane meritocracy now where people are, um, I say meritocracy in scare quotes, where people are like, you know, w w w you know, trying to get their kids into like, uh, uh, you know, 
private schools that cost like fifty thousand dollars of tuition a year. That's ridiculous. If there there is so much more that people would learn if they just sent their kids to public school, that their kids would learn if they just sent their kids to public school, than if they you know. It, and I don't mean to insult everybody here, if they were just not preoccupied with making sure their kid gets into Harvard in, in 20 years. Hi, my name is Blake. Identify I'm yourself a, also, if you don't mind. Yes, I'm a sophomore here at the college. Um, my question, it, it seems to me that for most of the discussion, until just the very end, we focused on the idea that our current political state is the result of a systemic failure in our political system to prevent what happened, like you said at the beginning, um, Mr. Goldberg, about the guardrails that have failed. Instead of our political system failing the people that felt such economic desperation that they wanted to select anything other than the status quo, even if that was President Trump. So my question is, should we focus on the idea that our system has failed the people and that they're justified in their anger, or should we focus on the idea that there is no justification for this and we need to change our system in order to equalize uh, our voices? So um, I would go at it a slightly different way, in all honesty, and that, I mean, that comes back to the conversation we actually had a little bit more than a year ago, where I think it's really important that what happened in 2016 is recognized as a symptom of much deeper underlying causes. So in other words, we don't need to kind of fixate, from my point of view, quite so much on 2016. Um, and so then, for me, you know, actually this sort of much more important indicator is the point where Congress hit 9% approval rating in 2013, um, and it's, you know, currently bounces around at about 20%. And why does that matter? It matters because the first branch of government, regardless of what people say about co-equal, the first branch of government is the legislature. All right? You cannot have democracy unless you have an organ through which the will of the people is expressed, and that is the job of the legislative branch. The executive branch does not have a job until the people expresses its will. That's why it's number two in the Articles of Confederation. All right? So if your main vehicle for expressing the will of the people is so dysfunctional that you get a 9% approval rate, you have to recognize that you have your, your democracy isn't working, it's not working for you. And so the point is just to sort of return us to the idea that then, you know, if when people make choices that look sort of strange or where sort of a demagogue um, can emerge, um, what that represents is like not a moment sort of, from my point of view, for judging those people particularly, um, as for grappling with the underlying problems that have made our shared institutions, the thing we built and own together, our collective asset, not work for us. Um, and that for me just sort of changes the focus of where our effort and attention should be. So that's why, I mean, I know I'm repeating myself. I'm repeating sort of what I said earlier as opposed to sort of answering your question, but I'm repeating myself because what I, my basic message is like, we've got to shift our focus. We've got to shift our focus to democracy itself, to what we can build and own and love together. Um, and if we can't do that, then we will be stuck in this kind of endless cycle of vituperative um, anger and mutual recrimination. Um, I, th I think, you know, there's a distinction between acknowledging uh, that people's suffering is legitimate and saying that their reaction to that suffering is legitimate. And, you know, when we talk about people who, you know, feel like they got a raw deal in the past 10 years and, and they were willing to do anything, well, you know, almost the entire, like, like the, the vast majority of black and Hispanic wealth uh, in the United States was wiped out by the recession. Those people did not go and pull the lever for Donald Trump. Why didn't they? They didn't do it because he was blaming them for those problems. Right. Um, and so, it, you know, it's one thing to say that there is a serious, um, tr there's a tremendous economic problem where people who um, were, were doing well are now doing extremely poorly and, and they're going to look at the government and blame them for that. But there is an ideological lens through which they view their misfortune, which can be right or it can be wrong. Um, and and, and it, it, the ideological lens that says that my economic misfortune is the result of immigration or the result of Obama doing too much for black people is just simply incorrect. And it's not a legitimate one in my view, um, which is not to say that those people are not legitimately struggling or that their feelings are not valid or real. It's just that it's not, it's just not right. And that, I just want to say that Adam made a really important point there, right? That we have developed this habit of um, separating 
the experiences of different groups of people who were actually all caught up in the same phenomenon. And the recession was, as you just pointed out, as bad for African Americans, Latino, Latinx Americans, et cetera, across the board, black and brown people. Um, and so, but we, we sort of have separated our sense of how much that experience matters. And so I think forward movement requires reintegrating um, that our understanding of how that experience matters. It is fascinating. In journalism, the expression working class denotes white Correct. people. Correct. When in fact, and Adam has pointed this out among yeah. other people. Can I, and I'm, thank you for your patience. Let me just follow up very quickly on one question. Um, because uh, the, the, the gentleman up there raise an interesting uh, possibility that there's some system that's better than the system that we have, the democratic system. In your experience teaching uh, young students, undergraduates, um, are you finding questioning about the underpinnings of our system that you have not found previously? And what does that mean? Well, I mean, I think probably you've all seen the data point, right? That um, whereas for generations born before World War II, about 70% um, think that it's essential to live in a democracy. For millennials, that number is just under 30%. Um, and then for the millennials who don't think it's essential to live in a democracy, it seems to be this sort of opinion seems to scatter around people who think that they just want sort of experts to figure it out and be in charge, and people who think that socialism, you know, described in some sort of imprecise way, um, is the alternative, as if those are, you know, have to be opposed to each other. Um, so I think. Um, you know, A, you know, people have grown up in a context where in very many ways democracy doesn't seem to function. Um, you know, B, we've all been living in a world where people have been making the argument sort of, you know, China delivers material well-being to its people without being, you know, we are seeing sort of counter-argument to that now as sort of we watch um, events in Hong Kong, but that's a part of the picture. Um, and then there's the question of how the sort of Scandinavian model sort of fits into the mix. And, you know, if you're sort of like Scandinavian, does that make you not democratic? No, you know, not exactly. So that's sort of a place where things get sort of complicated. Um, but I do think that and if we're covering an interest in an investment in democracy, it's not enough just to exhort people to love democracy. I think we do have to address the kind of cultural points that Adam is pointing to, the issues of histories of domination and inequality, um, and we also have to address the institutional questions. And so that's sort of like there's a body of work that we have to do in order to make democracy sort of recognizably viable to young people. Go ahead, sir. Sorry. Hi, my name's Luke. I'm a sophomore at the college. So, Adam, in your most recent piece in the December issue, you wrote, the true cause of American political discord is the lingering resistance of those who have traditionally held power to sharing it with those who until recently have only experienced its serrated edge. Um, and a common form of power is access. And so I wanted to ask a question more about higher education and how higher education institutions have become more accessible to a larger body of people in America. And with that, there have been pushes for more inclusion and more welcoming spaces on campuses. At the same time, we've seen growing and recycled concerns about free speech and expression on campuses. Um, and I'm curious how you think that conversation and the context of what we're talking about with civility um, how that fits in, and who often those concerns about expression are applied to and for, and um, how we frame often uh, expression and speech within the context of civility in the college campuses. Um, I think that we spend, I think that it is a reflection of the, um, it is an unfortunate reflection of the increasingly white collar nature of journalism that we spend so much time discussing the politics of elite college campuses. I, I don't think it matters that much in the larger scheme of things. I think it is tremendously politically useful for people who want to demonize those spaces and to, to create a kind of resentment uh, for higher education in general. But I do not think that in the long run, um, the, the, these arguments are as tremendously important as they are made out to be. Um, as I wrote in the piece, you know, societies are constantly renegotiating the ba boundaries of decency. What was okay, you know, today, uh, you know, was not okay a hundred years ago and vice versa. I mean, you, you think about, I mean, for, I mean, there was, a, there was a time in the United States where, you know, people proudly identified as Negro. Well, you know, you're not going to go up and call someone a Negro today if you don't want to get in a fight. Uh, so, you know, it's not, it, you know, these things are constantly changing and there's obviously for some people that can be very uncomfortable. Um, but it, it, it's not necessarily, and, and this is part of what the piece is about, the fact that we are having these arguments is not necessarily evidence that everything is breaking down. Every 
like every generation has these arguments about what it means to be a good person, what it means to be respectful, um, and how to behave ethically uh, with other people. And I think that it's fine for us to have those conversations and it's fine for us to yell at each other about it and it's just really not the end of the world. Sorry, I don't know if that was exactly what, the answer that you wanted, but. <laughs> Hi, my name is Abby Conyers, and I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. I read Tara Westover's piece in this past month's Atlantic, uh, and she certainly, I think, agrees with you, Professor Allen, that reconciliation is essential, uh, but she focuses her interview specifically on rural America. And you mentioned, Professor Allen, uh, that it's important to reduce the overweight of political voice in rural areas uh, through your proposal regarding Congress. Uh, and I'm wondering if you guys could speak to the, if there is a way to bring along rural communities uh, that have been left behind rather than further sort of pushing them out. So I think that that question is one of the most important ones we have. I wanna, one little tiny footnote before I dive into that though, just to sort of say, again, like there, there's a, sort of like a double challenge. I mean, one is to see problems like experiences that rural areas have had, but the other is also to be able to narrate those stories in ways that connect them to the experiences of other Americans. So I'll just give like one more example of that problem. Um, you probably have all seen the reporting on the rise of deaths of despair in white working class men without high school degrees. I mean, sort of deaths by suicide, alcoholism, opioid use, and that sort of thing. And the sort of stunning feature of this data is that mortality rates for white working class men without high school degrees um, have risen. It's like one group where there's been a rise over the last decade. Um, and so that's gotten a lot of play in the press. Uh, but when you look at the data, um, they've risen to the same level at which the mortality rates currently exist for African-American working class men without a high school degree. Right? So that's the real story. The real story is that both of these groups have too high mortality rates. So just want, I'm just sort of repeating the point that as we sort of think about rural areas and the experience of white working class people, we always want to be able to put that in the bigger picture of what's happening to low-income Americans generally, all low-income Americans. Um, so in that regard, I think some of what I would want to say about rural areas relates to some of what I would say about stressed areas of urban communities. So for one thing, um, both areas have been very badly affected by criminal justice policies, where as people have struggled with health issues, mental health issues and things of that kind, they have been pulled into the criminal justice system. That is true white and black across the board in those two spaces. And that is just something that we have to address from my point of view through legalization and decriminalization and a health paradigm for addressing the kind of underlying issues that have led to substance use disorder of various kinds. Relatedly, both areas lack economic opportunity. Um, both areas require place-based investment. Um, I think one of the stunning things, if you sort of travel around the country and pay attention to which regions are growing and which regions are failing, the ones that are growing are the ones that have actually made health the driver of their economy, right? There are hospitals and all kinds of sort of proliferation of medical services and things like that. And so we can see places that are succeeding. How do we take their lessons, what they've learned, the kinds of investments they've had, and use them more broadly in both urban and rural spaces that are failing, et cetera. So you can kind of go down the line in that way. Um, I think there we have lots of policy tools available to us for addressing these issues. It's one of my great frustrations that our kind of national politics does not give us the space we need to move forward in this way. Um, the questions have all been great. We are running out of time, so I thought maybe we can just grab the last two very quick questions and maybe Adam and Danielle can then sum up. Want to just go ahead? Sure, thank you. Um, so this conversation has sort of seemed to be circling around this idea that narratives and stories have a real power in shaping our reality. Mr. Goldberg, you made the point that if you're living in different areas, you can sort of be living in different stories by the nature of the increasing isolation of the stories that we're sort of crafting and sharing and consuming. Um, as we think about reshaping these narratives, do you all have a theory on what the recipe is to do that, considering the different forces that drive the creation of these stories from media to education to policy to popular culture? And what are sort of the leading indicators there? I'm sorry, I, I don't think I quite understand the question. So to get specific, democracy, race, the American idea, all of these are just stories that we've crafted, that we tell ourselves that sort of shape our reality and in fundamental ways are driving a lot of the issues that we've been discussing tonight. What is your theory on where these 
where this web of stories, how it develops among these different drivers mm -hmm. from media, policy drives our, our values and our stories, education, popular culture. What are, uh, y'all have leaned into media clearly as a way to shape and drive stories. Maybe why did you choose that among the various ways to shape stories and what do you see as sort of leading indicators as we're trying to reshape these narratives moving right. forward? Why don't we just grab the, grab the next okay. question and then sort of maybe wrap it up. Yeah. Yeah, does the, uh, does the press tend to uh, look at President Trump through a quote-unquote ideological lens? The president has brought us peace and prosperity, and yet no matter what he does, there's a negative reaction, an almost visceral reaction on the part of uh, much of the press. So how can anyone appreciate uh, any type of reconciliation when we see that the press itself is uh, so partisan? Even Obama recently has called out cancel culture. <laughs> it seems to be reaching extremes that make it impossible for people to do anything but pick a side. These questions are interestingly linked. It's Go ahead. True. Well, I was going to tell a story. I don't know if it'll, um, it, it'll connect. It'll connect, I guess, to both probably, uh, which is uh, one of the most interesting fights about our narrative, from my point of view, this is like slightly esoteric, but is the fact that we actually fight over whether to call this country a democracy or a republic. Are you guys aware of that? Okay, it's like in Utah, you are not, you're not allowed to teach students that it's a democracy. You have to teach students that this is a republic. This is a complete red herring, okay? At the founding, people used both vocabulary. Some people called it a republic, Hamilton called it a representative democracy, right? So it is possible to find both traditions right from the get-go. So for me, the question is, well, why are we fighting over this? These fights are proxies, right, when we sort of fight in this kind of narrative way. And there's sort of, there's actually a kind of question at stake in that terminology. Sort of question of like, are you a sort of thoroughgoing egalitarian or are you somebody who is focused on sort of limiting structures, structures that limit egalitarianism, so to speak. So the, side, the Republic side is more interested in rule of law, law and order, those kinds of concepts. The democracy side is much more interested in social equality, social justice, and that kind of thing. So where do you go when you have that kind of distinction? In various collaborations, actually, I've been collaborating with people on civic education, trying to design curriculum and so forth, and trying to figure out how to bring people together from different states to have a kind of shared vocabulary for talking about civic education. And the place we have landed is to say that what we are doing is educating for constitutional democracy. Okay, that has been our compromise from a narrative point of view. So, I mean, to the point of the other question, yes, there are different frames. There's a democracy frame and there's a republic frame. That absolutely affects reporting and storytelling and so forth. But forward moving requires, I think, people from different sides of that division coming together in concrete decision-making spaces, making things together, and actually working through compromises. And but that's one small example. We're all on board using the phrase constitutional democracy. It's got the kind of blend of the egalitarian and the recognition that constitutions are supposed to provide structure and order, and so we're able to work from there. That's what it means to find a compromise. From my point of view, that's a small example of kind of narrative reconciliation. So, uh, I, you know, uh, why doesn't, so first of all, I'm uh, an opinion columnist, so I write my opinion. Um, the media is not a monolith, um, but if you're wondering why the media has not reported that Donald Trump has brought peace and prosperity to America, it's because he has not done that. Um, the job growth in the first half of the Trump administration is lower than it was in the latter half of the Obama administration. My wife just got back from her third deployment in Afghanistan, a war that is old enough to vote. So the answer to the question, why aren't we talking about all the peace and prosperity that Donald Trump has brought us, it's because it didn't happen. I'm sorry. Um, thank you, Adam. The, um, your, your question is an interesting one. I mean, I think among the many experiments that uh, we're so I, 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 there are many experiments going on in American life right now. Um, we are involuntary subjects it, in a lot of them. I mean, one of the largest, and, and it undergirds all these sorts of conversation, is where we are, we are involuntary participants in an experiment in, in how much information um, we can take in, um, how to disaggregate good information from bad information. We are, uh, there has never been a figure, and I'm not trying to over-personalize it, but there's never been like a, f a figure in human history like Mark Zuckerberg, who has connected this many people to each other instantaneously. Um, and so uh, the, 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 the questions that you're posing are, are deeper than anything we're gonna get to in, in, in two minutes or, or three hours. Um, but I would say that we are 
living in a kind of Madisonian nightmare at the moment. In terms of cognition and communication, I mean, Madison was extremely worried about the impact of the daily advent of the daily newspaper. Too much information was coming to people too quickly, and the newspapers were shrinking the geographic distance that kept people from forming mob faction. Um, I mean, Madison, of course, believed that the president of the United States, again, the primacy of the legislative branch, the president of the United States should not be in direct communication with the American people. That would cause too much heat and, and friction. So I think part of the problem, and this is what we're trying to do here with this issue and we're trying to do with the Atlantic, uh, is to go way underneath um, the, 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 the furor and the noise. And obviously, the, the current political climate, uh, we have to address that every day. Um, and the latest outrage and the latest anger and the latest um, uh, upending of norms. Uh, but, but we're really trying to figure out what, uh, what, the, what the questions behind the questions are. Uh, and so I, I hope you en enjoyed this forum. I hope you enjoy this issue. I hope you subscribe to The Atlantic, actually, uh, because democracy depends on you subscribing <laughs> to something. Um, and I, I want to thank Adam very much, and I want to thank Danielle very much, Mark, uh, and everybody here at the IOP. Thanks very, very much for coming. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs>